Yeah, uh, I'm here to talk about Ember.js. So I asked um, <laughs> what I should keep the, keep it on, and uh, I was asked to hold a holistic talk. Uh, so I'm going to keep it floating, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, so it won't be really hardcore. Uh, it'll be um, some basics and some uh, topics that you might not have been um, um, not have been uh, uh, I've seen before. Sorry, I'm, I just held hello training course. So my brain is a little bit uh, so. I'm sure I'll get in, in uh, fairly quick. So just uh, really short about me. My name is uh, Joachim. You can call me Joe. Uh, I work uh, as an independent uh, consultant uh, at a as a freelancer, and that's where I make my uh, money. And then I have side products that I do, um, where I uh, sort of uh, get an outlet for. Uh, for my technical desires, often. Uh, so the reason I'm here, I guess, is um, um, I've written uh, Ember Days in Action. Uh, so I think that's the first major book that's come out with uh, on the topic of Ember. Um, and I'm also organizing Emberfest. Uh, so last year we were in uh, in Munich, and we are going to go to Barcelona in uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, ticket sales are have uh, uh, expired. <laughs> But um, I do have some tickets if someone really wants to go to a beach in Barcelona and uh, hang out. Um, the venue is really close to the beach. Yeah. So this is what I work on on my spare time. I'm uh, writing a uh, monitoring agent or a monitoring application. Uh, and I'm also writing uh, sort of like a CMS for, uh, for Ember data. So it's not, it won't host your uh, content like uh, WordPress, but it'll host your data and it'll be Ember data compliant. Uh, and via my uh, local library, I'm uh, teaching kids to code, uh, and I'm publishing um, um, the, the material that we teach there online. And we'll just have a brief look at that later when we talk about Fandom JS uh, and uh, search search engine optimization later. So I usually start to ex explain where Ember fits in the stack. Um, Usually, when or when I get start, got started with Ember a couple of years ago, this is where it fit in. So, sorry if you had a an application that looked like an application and it really looked like an application, like Google Maps does, and that's where it would fit in. And it sort of inherited that from Spark Core, and with Spark Core, it was even narrower up here. Um, but uh, as of uh, the first, uh, the final release of Ember, and uh, moving towards uh, the later releases. It stretches more and more out to, to encompass more types of applications. So they're still single page applications, but they sort of they can now look and behave more like a website than an application. Um, so it fits in to more of your uh, to a wider uh, array, array of developers. In uh, but usually they are uh, they're all single page apps. Uh, I haven't seen an Ember app that's not a single page app. Um, they're highly interactive, and they often uh, can have that wow factor that you're looking for, uh, or that you want your users to have when they use your software. <coughs> so it really comes from the old age where um, we didn't have uh, we had uh, HTTP requests, and they weren't AJAX or they weren't uh, async; they were just synchronous requests, uh, and that. Um, if you worked with websites from the 2000s or from the uh, late 90s, uh, you know the pain points here. You make a request, uh, you have to assemble everything up, package it up, send it to the, to the client or the browser, and the browser would render that. And then uh, there was no dynamicity after that. And then uh, for the next request, it had to do the same work, ship it off to the client, and so on and so forth. And then came uh, Ajax. And it promised a whole new world. Now all websites would be dynamic, they would be fluent, and they would be uh, a good user experience. So they sort of promised that you would send the whole um, package on the first request, and then after that, you would only receive partial page updates. But it turns out that this is really, really hard. Because unless you really tailor your backend, uh, knowing uh, it's hard for the backend to know exactly what to send to the front end. So if you have a sort of a shopping cart application, and you add something to your cart, you both want to update the cart, but you might also want to update a part of the page that says, 
uh, you might also want to look like look at these uh, items. Uh, and if you have uh, thousands of clients, uh, just keeping bookkeeping that state uh, is difficult and it's hard to scale. So uh, most uh, AJAX frameworks, uh, Dojo and in Java, we had a, a JSF, and uh, we had others in .NET had their MVCs. Uh, and what they did was that for each request, they would still just ship you the whole package. And then the client would just pick, you, um, pick from the, your uh, DOM IDs, and um, cherry pick, and then uh, swap them out. So now you had a client that was more dynamic. It felt more dynamic. But the server now had 20 times uh, as much load, because uh, everything the user did uh, required a whole new uh, request from the server. So this is where uh, single page applications come in. Uh, and they really uh, follow up on that promise that on the first request, you do get your whole application, the whole website, everything. And then once that's done, you don't transfer anything but data. And that makes it uh, a lot easier to scale because uh, the, the server doesn't really need to know uh, where your client or where the client is at. You can be logged in on mobile and on your desktop, and you, you can have two different sessions. And the server doesn't really care. It just ships the data you ask for uh, if you're allowed to, to view it. Uh, so Ember, I think, has the most complete MVC pattern, uh, at least for uh, web frameworks. Uh, but it also has, if you look at uh, sort of uh, old MVC patterns for a uh, framework from, from Java or .NET, the Ember MVC pattern is also fairly complete. So it consists of views, and uh, views also use templates to help render, uh, render the, uh, the DOM tree that um, the browser uh, uh, gets. So that uh, it has uh, enriched the view, the view layer with a strong templating uh, library. And on the controller side, uh, it has enriched controllers with the Ember router. And the Ember router is uh, really, uh, at least in web frameworks, a game changer in how you can st structure your application into separate chunks. And they can be completely separate without you having to um, sort of write jQuery spaghetti code. Uh, it really helps you to separate out your logic into a sane structure. And as long as you don't uh, fight uh, <laughs> that structure, you'll be OK. Sometimes you do need to, to make uh, uh, to fight this, the, the built-in structure, but if for the mo most part you can just you can follow along that and it'll be uh, your code will be manageable. Uh, and Ember doesn't really have anything for the model. It has Ember object, um, but Ember data uh, includes a rich model layer that you can um, tie in uh, fairly easily or really easily. Uh, so. This sort of structure where um, that uh, your users or your actions uh, go through uh, Ember uh, comes from uh, Sprout Core. Uh, I think Eric Eric Ocean uh, from he was involved with the Sprout Core project, uh, coined it the V property. Uh, and what it means is usually you start with um, initiating an action on the view, so the user clicks a button or a timer fires or something happens on the view, and that fires an action to your controller or or your router. Uh, and that, again, asks for data and the model layer. And then bindings and observers will propagate that back up to your view. And you don't have to start here every time. But the important thing is that if you start here, like if you start with an async call into your model layer, the uh, important thing is that Ember, Ember will keep your data flowing the right way. It won't suddenly start doing mocking something in the view and then start this whole process again. sort of went through this. So there are three um, sort of main features that Ember relies on. Uh, and it relies on that in a heavily in its own API or its own library. Uh, and we use them often without really thinking about that we are using them. It has bindings. Everyone sort of that has used Ember for a while uh, get to know bindings and how they work. Uh, and usually, uh, before, uh, earlier, before uh, the first 1.0 release, we, I had a lot of bindings in my controllers uh, with the suffix binding to make, uh, to bind this content variable to, to whatever this other controller held in its selected uh, notes. Um, 
but these days I hardly ever use this. Uh, it all, it's always bind, bound via the handlebars templates. And then there's computer properties, uh, and then those are just there are functions and that can be exposed to your Ember templates. And that's basically sort of a short narrative of what it is. And they are kept up to date whenever uh, the values that they rely on update. And there's uh, observers. And they are uh, also normal functions, but they fire whenever some data you are listening to change. Uh, in other languages, they're called listeners. And uh, observers, I think, comes from, rail <coughs> from Rails. Yeah. So I'll uh, just talk a little bit about Ember router, and then I'll move on to some something more specific. So the router is the uh, backbone of your application. Uh, it defines the logical path that the users are allowed to take uh, throughout your application, as well as it helps structure your application's uh, uh, different parts into separate containable areas. Uh, and that means that if you have uh, if you have an application that does uh, that has um, uh, yeah. uh, say you have a, a photo album application, you can uh, you can uh, make sure that all the data that belongs with uh, an album doesn't mix in with the data that belongs to your photographs, for instance. Uh, yeah. So we'll be looking at an uh, an application shortly, uh, and it's uh, <laughs> it is a photo album application, uh, and it's uh, sort of a, a, a minim minimal styled application. It looks sort of horrendous, uh, but the point is that we're going to add some stuff to it, and so we're going to add some animations, and we're going to look at um, uh, look at um, binding uh, your um, sorry uh, binding your um, um, HTML properties uh, and some other stuff. Yeah, I'll just skip this, I think. Uh, uh, okay. Um, I should have, sorry. Okay, so uh, this is a simplified state chart for Ember data. It sort of looks like um, uh, this is the normal path that your data uh, has. So it, the data starts out loaded, meaning that it's come from the server side and it's loaded okay in your application. Uh, so it's loading while it's waiting for it to come in and then it's loaded once uh, Ember data has uh, completed its propagation into uh, Ember objects. And then typically you'll uh, you'll make some edits to your uh, data, uh, which means that your your uh, models become dirty. And then uh, you can save that uh, data, which means it'll send it to the server side. Uh, and then it, it'll be in an in-flight mode uh, until the server responds. So either it times out and you get an error, or it uh, can't be parsed and, uh, and the data is invalid, or it goes back to loaded. So this is sort of. Um, the happy path for Ember data is sort of just within this uh, circle. Um, yeah. So I'll uh, just explain quickly. Uh, it's a sort of an overwhelming slide. I'll explain it in detail. Uh, so this is uh, Ember data's uh, view of the world. Uh, so Ember data is implemented as an identity map, and what that means is that. Uh, for ev every time you ask Ember data for an object of a certain type with a certain ID, you can be sure that you get the same instance back. It won't create a new one and that has the same data, but you actually get the, the very same instance. So in this case here, you ask for uh, to find all uh, blog posts in a blog application, and Ember data doesn't have any data for, for blog posts at all. So what it does is it creates an empty array and just sends that synchronously back to your, to your controller or to your uh, application. And what that does is that uh, Ember can then start setting up all your routes, your views, and templates while it's waiting for the data to arrive. Uh, and then, 
uh, asynchronously at the same time as it creates this empty array. It goes asynchronously to the server uh, to get all your posts. And then when, they, when, they, when the posts come in, it will propagate the identity map, and then it'll, it will send that data back to the client. And at which point uh, you've bound or you're, you're observing that data, and it will be propagated out to your view, and your application will be updated. And most likely, uh, Ember has already been able to set up your, your routes and your templates so that it'll feel uh, pretty snappy, even though you're actually waiting for the server. And then each of these posts have a set of comments. Uh, and then when you use them on the page, it'll ask Ember Data for, to get those comments. And again, it doesn't, it doesn't really have them. So at this point, it will just, um, well, when it, it came in here, it created these uh, empty objects with just the ID, because the ID was the only thing that it actually knew about uh, the, the comments. So then it'll, it'll get, uh, fetch that from the server side, and it uses this sort of strange PHP sort of uh, structure uh, to get all three, uh, all three IDs, or all three um, comments for the first post here. Um, so it'll return that back, and then it'll arrive at this, your uh, application, and your application can display them. Um, yeah. And depending on how your application is, you can either do it this way, or you can sideload data here. So you could potentially, because you're asking uh, for, you, you get two posts returned here, and there are six comments. So potentially, you could also return these comments and sideload them here. Uh, and that will be make it into one request instead of two. So depending on your load and how much data that is, uh, that might be a better option. So we'll do a little bit of live coding. I won't do too much. Uh, and then uh, we'll look at uh, PhantomJS uh, afterwards. So just to explain, we have this uh, really badly styled uh, photo album application. And it has four photo albums, and you can select one. You get up uh, some uh, photographs, uh, and you can select either of these <coughs> to view the photograph. And there's supposed to be some information on the side here. Uh, and then you can also select the next uh, photograph, and it, it'll go around if you go if you go beyond the border on either end, it'll go just wrap around and start from the beginning or from the end. So, uh, the first thing we want to do here is we just want to just fill in this information that's here. Uh, and here we have the data for this, uh, for this um, photograph. I'll just find the same photograph. So here we have the data that we're going to display. It has uh, a description, and it has a name as well. So the first thing we'll do is we'll go into our um, template here. So it's set up so that each template has its own file, uh, and each class has its own uh, JavaScript file. Uh, and Grunt will assemble this in the background automatically when I make changes. I'll just double check that that's running. Yeah. So here we have that uh, information heading here. So we'll just quickly just add a table uh, with some contents. Uh, so we're, we're adding. Uh, Like so. So we're just simply adding the information here. But as you can see here, the text here is sort of uh, not formatted the way we had it in, uh, in here. Well, we have line shifts and we have a list as well. Um, so we're just going to convert this here, uh, which is uh, markdown, into HTML. And there's multiple ways of doing that. Uh, you can do it in your controller, or you can do it in your model. Uh, you can create an, uh, a computer property that does that automatically. Uh, 
And then, so the, 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 the easy way is to create a, uh, create a computer property and just uh, convert your markdown there. Upside being that it's easy, the downside being that for each and every photograph you have, you're going to do that markdown conversion, even though you won't display it on your page at all. Uh, so up here, it's hard to, hard to tell, but this folder here is called, uh, it's called helper. <coughs> and I'll just create a, a, a helper in here. So what I'll do is to write a uh, handlebars helper that I can use to convert markdown into HTML. So I'll just call this um, uh, Markdown Helper. <coughs> and then I'll uh, register uh, a bound helper uh, with Ember. So it goes ember.handlebars.register bound helper. Is that readable at all on the back? Yeah. Uh, and then we need to give this helper a name. And we're just going to call it Markdown. And that takes a uh, function with a single parameter called a um, uh, single parameter. We just call that property. <coughs> so in here, uh, we can uh, put our code to convert the value of this property uh, into HTML. So I'll just uh, instantiate a converter. Uh, I should also tell uh, inside my uh, index HTML file, I'm including a library called Showdown, which is a markdown converter for uh, for the web, I guess. <coughs> so this is new, oops, new Showdown dot converter, like so. And then I don't want to convert anything if this property is null or if it's undefined, because then my whole application will crash. So I need to check uh, if property. Oops. And then I'm gonna just going to return uh, new handlebars dot save string converter dot make HTML property. Like so. So what, it, what this does is that we pass in a property. If that property uh, has a value, we're going to instantiate or we instantiate a converter. And then we're just going to convert that whatever this value ha or whatever this property has as a value into HTML. And then we use this handlebars.save string to tell uh, Ember that, hey, I know what I'm doing. Uh, I know that this is uh, returning raw HTML. It's going to insert it straight into the DOM. Um, but that's okay. Uh, usually, uh, you would need some sort of source checking. Like you only do this if you really have control of what this property is. Uh, so if you have a form that your users can fill out, this is a really bad idea. Um, so then I can go back into um, my photo template, and then instead of just Instead of using the uh, this just printing out the description property, I can simply now just type in markdown. And then when I refresh uh, my oops <laughs> my application, uh, it now looks like it did in when I typed in the data. So I have line breaks and I have uh, created a list. Uh, so uh, handbars helpers are really handy for things like this, or if you need to do um, convert numbers into uh, accounting or uh, sort of uh, dollars and cents, or if you have weights and you need to convert them from grams to kilos, or any sort of like utility function uh, that you would otherwise put somewhere in some controller uh, and just call randomly. Uh, this makes it handy. Uh, you don't ever uh, call this markdown conversion on uh, code you're not displaying. Because if you're not displaying it, this template won't be executed. Uh, so in that sense, it's quite handy. Another option would be to create a, uh, a component and then do it inside the component. Uh, but I, I don't really think that doing this is a component. So then the next thing we're going to do is uh, 
just make these images so that we can see which one is the selected one. I mean, we can, we can see it down here, but just to have some visual, visual uh, guidance up here. Uh, and I've structured it so that this view here, this uh, view here is a component. Uh, so the component itself, the template, is rather empty and contains nothing. And the reason for that is that everything is in the component class. So you might ask what, what the point is to have this as a component if it doesn't have a template. And I quite agree. Um, it could be a view instead. And the handy thing about having it as a component is that it doesn't have access to your controller. So that whenever you, wherever you put it, you can be sure that this won't uh, mangle with your, uh, with your controller's context. So here we will bind um, a CSS property uh, called is selected, so that whenever an image is selected, uh, it'll add is selected as a CSS class. So we've added the photo th thumbnail uh, as a CSS class using class names. And then we can use class name names bindings. Like so. And what, what we're saying here is that we're binding is selected to uh, something in, in uh, to a function or a property inside this component. So then we need to define it. And it needs to be a property because it needs to be able to access it as a property. So you can have to say, be able to say dot get and is selected. So if I return true in here, uh, and wait a little bit for Grunt to do his work, no? There you go. Um, they all get a, a black border around them. So in order to only make the selected uh, one uh, have a border, uh, we can look back uh, here. This is where we call our, uh, our component. And here we pass in uh, um, a selected photo. And this is the selected photo from the controller. And then we pass in the photo that's going to display. So we only need to compare those two inside the component. Uh, if this was a view, I wouldn't have had to do either that or that, because the view would have uh, had access to it uh, via the controller anyways. Uh, but it's nice to have it separated out, so you don't, so you, you have to send, send in to your component whatever variables you want to use. Um. So in here, I'm going to uh, bind to the photo.id as well as the um, selected photo.id. And I'm just going to return true if those are the same. Like so. And the nice thing about having it as bindings is that I don't have to do anything else for, for it to display correctly. So it doesn't matter if I click the photograph or if I uh, click the next to previous button or if I refresh. Um, so that's one of the really nice things about Ember and the way it handles bindings and propagates it out to the view. You don't really have to think about uh, how your <coughs> application or how your uh, web app should uh, handle select, uh, showing what is selected and what is not. As, or, and, uh, so your, your views are always consistent with the data you, that you have in, in your model layer. Um, okay. 
Let's add something a little bit more uh, exciting. So I have this uh, album photo view, and that's this photograph here. Um, and it, it derives its name from the route it's in. So it's in a resource called uh, album and a route called photo. And what I want to do is when I click these buttons, I want to do some animations here before I switch it out. Um, and I, I do have actions here in my view. It's usually not common to have actions in your view. Um, so the, this, uh, this action could be split up so that uh, the content here could be in the controller and then only the animation is in the view. Uh, just for simplicity, I'll, I'll put it here. So this is just a logic for uh, finding out which photograph is the selected one and then moving back and forth with, uh, when you click on the buttons. And then it has a function down at the bottom uh, to animate out, which currently it doesn't do. Uh, it doesn't do anything but navigate to the selected photograph. So here we'll uh, add some uh, animations instead. So what we do here is uh, we're going to get the, the element ID, or the ID that uh, this view has in the DOM. So element ID equals this.get element ID. And that's one of the primary reasons why, uh, or that's one of the reasons why this needs to be in the view, because you need access to the element ID. And the other reason is that you don't really want to put animations in your controllers. Uh, it just doesn't belong there. Um, and then we are uh, going to have some callbacks. So we're going to have to need a reference to our view. So var view uh, equals this. And I'm going to use uh, jQuery. So this will fetch the ID of the, uh, the fetch the DOM element uh, from the DOM. Uh, problem is that then that's this whole area here. So we only want this photograph. And it has a CSS class of uh, large photo. So we'll just append that to the, append that to the CSS selector. Large photo. Uh, and then what we're going to do, we're going to sort of spin it around, fade it out, and then spin it back in and fade it in uh, with the new picture. So we're going to toggle. And after we toggle it, we're going to fade it out. Dot fade out. So we want to do this. See if we can scroll down. We want to do this animation here first. So we want to um, do the toggle animation first, and then we want to fade it out. And once that's done, this is the part where we want to swap out the image and fade it back in. Uh, so we need to put that code inside of this callback function. Because if we put it uh, just below, it's going to do that at, uh, at the same time, and in, you're not going to get any effect at all, really. Ah, uh, do I? Ah, oh, thanks. Uh, so, also, element ID is capital I in your variable. Ah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then in here, I'm going to do. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do a variation of this. So I'm going to toggle it back in, and then I'm going to fade it in. Uh, and then, uh, at the same time that I'm uh, doing this animation, I want to um, change my or I want to transition into a new route. Uh, and the good thing is that this animation will continue while we're swap swapping routes, so that it, even though we're doing it uh, one after another, it'll look like uh, we changed routes before the animation finished. 
So then in here we are going to do view dot get controller dot tran and we're gonna pass in this here. And that's just a a function on my controller uh, that has transition to route and the correct route and with a photo. Uh, there's multiple ways of doing this sort of thing. So now hopefully when I do this uh, it'll animate out and in. Okay. That was that's what was my uh, <laughs> what's the live coding I was going to do. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about search engine optimization, uh, and this is um, something that's really really important and it's also ridiculously hard. Uh, there's multiple steps involved, and it's quite hard to make a general uh, approach on how to solve this. Uh, Google has recently started indexing uh, JavaScript applications, um, but it's not complete. Uh, and it probably never will be as good as uh, it being able to read your HTML uh, right at the front. Uh, and it'll probably only be best if you use Angular. So search engine optimization is really all about getting your page ranked high in the free uh, parts of the search engines. Um, we do say search engine optimization, but we really do mean Google optimization, because we don't really care about the other search engines. So there are just two parts to uh, optimizing your page. The first is uh, what you can do with your page or with your site. Uh, and that is uh, you have control of your markup and your content uh, and your architecture. The second part of it, and it's equally important, is other people's websites. People or websites are linked into yours. Uh, so oftentimes it can be uh, financially good if you pay in gadgets to link to your, 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 your website. That might have a greater effect than anything you can do yourself depending on, your, on your, how many visitors you have and uh, how many other pages linked to yours. So the general rule then on what you can do with your site is to, is to have good, quali good quality content and a lot of readers. Uh, so you kind of have to, have to have that up front and then Google will uh, give you a good ranking unless you have a really, really obscure uh, niche market. Uh, and then you need to make sure that Every single page has a title, and that title has to be um, has to have give meaning to the page you're on. So you can't have the same title on all your pages because uh, uh, Google will Google will penalize you for it. And you also need to make sure that the text you have on your page includes all the keywords that you think your user might search for. Uh, you can't include them as keywords, but they have to be embedded in your in your text. And then the final part is you have to make your site crawl crawlable. Uh, and uh, typically, JavaScript applications are not at all. Uh, yeah. So PhantomJS, it's a, it's a headless browser. It's based on uh, WebKit. And what that means is that you can render any web page. Uh, you can uh, build up the DOM tree of any web page. And you can uh, in inspect it, or you can take a screenshot, uh, or you can save uh, or manipulate that HTML. Uh, you sh originally, it was developed to help testing, um, but these days you see PhantomJS used for uh, for a lot of different um, things, including this. Uh, so, in um, in my applications, I have a script that I run uh, that will crawl my page, uh, and it'll uh, help make it as uh, crawlable by Google. So the approach is that I have a hosted version of my site. And that is, needs to be a full version, because it needs to have all the data that your production site has. You can use production as well, uh, but then you will uh, sort of load, uh, put load on your production server. That might be OK, or it might not be, depending on your, your environment. And then you need to have a JavaScript ap application to actually crawl your website. Uh, and what I do is that I load up the index file, uh, or index.html, and then I will parse through that whole uh, file, and I will find any links uh, that are there. And then I will record those links, and I will add it to a list of links to visit, links to crawl. And then it'll go through 
uh, at a certain depth. So I can specify three or five or seven or, or whatever. So it'll go to a maximum of, say, four links in depth before it will stop. Uh, and what it does is that it takes uh, the HTML for the page, and it uh, renders the JavaScript application and stores that on disk uh, as a static HTML file. So the result looks like this. Uh, so on, the, on disk, it'll store uh, the structure uh, of your uh, website uh, as static files uh, all the way. Um, and then once this is done, uh, your backend needs to be able to read this and inject it into, into the page that it serves the client. So if you visit index.html, it needs to parse this file, get everything that's in the body of that file, and inject it into a no script tag on the page that it serves. And that means that for when you request an application, you will serve both the markup for your JavaScript single page app and the markup for a static version of that site. Um, and then it'll, it, it will include references to any third party resources, so images and CSS and all that. Uh, and if you keep it on the same level, meaning that if you start all your references with a slash, uh, you don't have to do anything else. Yeah. So well, we just talked about that. So it looks yeah, sort of like this. This is, uh, uh, this is the website as it is. So it's uh, the title and then CSS and uh, Google Analytics. And then down here, we have a NoScript tag. And inside that, we have the Ember application. That's the static version of it. So as you can see here, it, it's complete. It even has class equal Ember view. And it has uh, ID equals Ember 463, and so forth, and so on. What it doesn't have is script tags. So it stripped away all script tags. So all of those uh, script tags that you need for your bindings, all of those are stripped off. Um, and in addition to that, you need a sitemap file. And this file here contains just a sim simple reference to all of your URLs uh, that you want Google to index. Uh, if you don't have that, Google will just skip most of your page. Um, and since uh, your uh, phantom script already knows which URLs it's, it has visited, uh, it can generate that file uh, for you. Or you can write code to write, generate it. So this is what it looks like for, for this page, uh, website here. Uh, it's just a header for, uh, for the XML, and then it has a location for each and every URL that you, you want Google to, to index. And then you need to log into Google's uh, Webmaster Tools, and then you need to tell it where to find this file. So it needs to be uh, loadable uh, on your URL. So usually, it'll be a, your URL slash sitemap.xml. And if you're lucky, you don't have to tell Google. It'll find, find it itself. But only if you have like a couple of million visitors a day. Uh, otherwise, it won't bother. So the, here's the source code for this phantom script, which is a crawler. Uh, it is a work in progress. And it's very, very specific to this exact use case. Um, it's not intended for you to just grab off and just type phantom.js uh, crawl, and it'll work. Uh, it probably won't. Uh, but at least it's the starting point for to be able to crawl uh, a web page and generate uh, a static version. And then there's uh, the code for the back end here. So inside this application here, uh, this is where Emberfest's website is, host is hosted. There's a button here I can click. So whenever I add content, I can log in and uh, just click here. And then uh, it'll generate that for me. And then I can log into Webmaster Tools and just say, hey, my site is updated. So I'll just show you an example of what this looks like. Uh, so here uh, is an, uh, uh, it's an Ember application uh, that I've used to document um, all the material that, we, that I use when, I, when we have uh, kids at the library that wants to learn how to code. So we usually have some electronic projects that we work around. So this is an Ember app, and it works uh, as a single page application. Um, and but if I turn off, uh, and this is uh, in indexed with this uh, crawler script. So if I go in here and turn off JavaScript, so I just say do not allow uh, any scripts to run on this site or on this browser. And then I go back here, 
Chrome does this. No other browser does it. You have to re reload. It's strange. Um, but the site here is uh, generated. It's, uh, it has the same, it looks exactly the same. Uh, you, can, uh, you can browse through it. So I can click here again, and I can navigate into that uh, part of the page. Notice there's a sig significantly more uh, longer lag, because it actually has to go make a request and get the whole page in return. I can also uh, click here and I load that chapter. It takes a lot longer. Uh, but one of the upsides of doing it this way, rather than just uh, hoping that Google one day will index your Ember app, uh, is that now you have graceful, de uh, gra graceful degeneration of your, of your site. So you can actually serve your site to users that doesn't have JavaScript, even though your application is really developed with JavaScript in mind. I'll just turn on uh, JavaScript before I forget. <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, what I had. Thank you. Um, I run it um, with four uh, sort of simultaneously requests, um, but I've set it up so it, it won't thrash the website. Uh, so it usually it takes uh, a couple of minutes for uh, for this site. It has maybe 40 pages. Uh, I just set it up so it, it won't really thrash your page. Because when you make changes, Google's not going to index those pages for weeks and weeks. So it doesn't really have to go instant. In, Yeah. Uh, no, uh, Phantom JS will uh, load up the page, and it will uh, render the JavaScript and uh, just um, print out the DOM that's resulting of. So it's the same as loading it up in your browser, clicking View Source, uh, and then saving that to disk. So it just does it automatically instead of having it be a manual process. Uh, well, it has the same sort of structure as a real browser. So it, it is a WebKit browser. It just doesn't have a view for you. So the um, same as you can do document already in, uh, in jQuery, uh, you can uh, ask for when it's done. Uh, I am data. Okay, yeah. Um, usually Ember will render the parts that it has because the views will be loaded and it'll just have sections that are doesn't have any data. So uh, for the blog post, it will have the content for that and then it's waiting for the comments. So that's, that'll just be a blank area. Uh, and then when those comments are loaded into Ember data, uh, it will just automatically populate it up to the view and then it'll be visible on the, on the, page, on the site. Uh, uh, Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you mean in the Phantom script? Yeah. Uh, I usually just put a timeout. So uh, because it doesn't have to be fast, you can just set four seconds. And if it takes longer than that, then you should probably re rework your site. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. Pre-render, that's, that's a node, that's a node uh, 
Mm. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, great. So, um, 